Welcome home. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We call it Baltimore Positive, baltimorepositive.com. Hope you're uh, setting your dials out there on the, the AM side. I saw the little BAL uh, logo on the pitcher's mound the other day. I'm like, yeah, they still come to AM radio. Sure they do. They come to YouTube. They come to LinkedIn. They come to Facebook and Twitter and X and threads and all these other places. Uh, when you find us, know about the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. We're going to be kicking this thing back off next Tuesday in time for the Orioles to go to Fenway. We're doing a morning into the afternoon, 2 o'clock first pitch uh, at Fenway. We're going to be over at Costas um, where they need you. They need they need your help. Uh, the bridge is down. They're at the foot of the bridge for the most part. Um, my dad passed there on the way to Bethlehem Steel many, many years back in the 70s bringing me home shrimp and crab cakes from uh, from Costa. So we're going to go over there on the 9th. It's all brought to you by the Maryland Crab Cake uh, Tour and our friends at the Maryland Lottery and Jiffy Lube and Liberty Pure Solutions. We're going to be telling you about all of our sponsors here going into the spring. Also have a 25th anniversary documentary that's coming out a little later on in the month. I don't know exactly when it's coming out. Uh, my friends at Curio Wellness are teasing me that maybe we should do it on 420. We'll see. Might not be done. I think if I, as long as I get it out by April 30th, which is the anniversary of Bruno San Martino uh, losing the belt to superstar Billy Graham because I remember these things and it is a WrestleMania week here and Lucas and I had uh, a glorious time on opening day and uh, we're gonna have a glorious time on the 12th uh, that's next Friday we're doing live radio so there's one more thing I could check off after 10 years of people bitch you ain't live on the radio no more nasty so uh, two to five next Friday Friday's Fadley's live Try saying that a whole bunch. Uh, I'll be giving away I'll have some Pac-Man scratch-offs by then because uh, uh, Roz over at the Maryland Lottery will hook us up with that. Uh, he will be there from 2 until 3. He has a media credential. He enters after 3. I sit from 3 until 5 and, like, eat crab cakes and drink beer and get ready for baseball. First place baseball. Didn't look that way so much on Sunday, but um, – Decent start to the campaign, despite the fact that they couldn't hit the ball on Sunday, Luke. And this will happen across the course of a 162-game campaign. How are you holding up? Happy post-Easter. Uh, happy pre-WrestleMania. Um, we'll talk about the Ravens, but we don't need to right now. Like, we can just let that go for a little while and just get into this baseball team. But um, the heartbeat of baseball, it's back, man. No question about it. And lots of, lots of other things going on and Final Four and WrestleMania, as you astutely pointed out, as I'm looking forward to that this coming weekend. But it's every night, the Orioles. Uh, it's settling into the routine that is a 162-game baseball season. The dream of an undefeated season came to an end on Sunday afternoon as the Orioles, who all they did was swing the bat on – Thursday and on Saturday night in support of Corbin Burns and Grayson Rodriguez. But uh, Tyler Wells got off to a shaky start and actually finished the start very well over the final four innings. He was out there, but they didn't hit. They didn't hit. They didn't swing the bats. Uh, I mean, it was just it's that simple. Sometimes I, I hate to sound so flippant about it, but to your point, this is when you need to get into the baseball mindset. It's not the Ravens where you're living and dying with every win and loss. It's hey, they lost on Sunday, but in the grand scheme of things, the big picture, you take two out of three. If that's your goal, if that's your objective, play 667 ball, and you could do that over the course of the season, they will be in really, really good shape. Well, so, dude, if you're just an Oriole fan and a Raven fan and you bet on sports or whatever your deal is and watching March, man, like, like the Terps lost a lot this year, you haven't really lost in a while, right? So, like, winning, winning, and it's spring training, and nothing matters, and it's all fun, and then, like, Hey, you know, my dad would have said they should have saved some of them runs for Sunday. Is what? <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I mean, you you score 24 runs over the first two games, which, uh, believe it or not, I think was the second most in franchise history over the first two games, which, funny enough, I think it was the 2006 Orioles. I mean, go figure on that. It's not like they were any good. Uh, but it's just a reminder of, yep, you can score 13 runs one night, and the next night you – Finished with, what, three hits, uh, which they had on Sunday. So didn't really even mount too many threats so over the course of the game, other than, you know, they, it's second inning where they had some guys on base, but, you know, hit, hit a lot of lazy fly balls. I, I Full disclosure, I wasn't watching the broadcast intently. I had the game on and was watching it that way, but uh, entertaining family for, for Easter Sunday, but they just didn't swing the bats. I mean, it was that simple, and you saw the at-bats were not very good, but. It happens. It's what we're going to see over the course uh, of 162. And for me, I'll, I'll go back to as much as scoring runs was fun 
on opening day and on Saturday. What I was most encouraged about by this opening season was indeed the starting pitching. I mean, Corbin Burns was as advertised. I saw you made some comments about it on Saturday. Grayson Rodriguez, not far behind. Uh, Burns in terms of dominance. I mean, he was really, well, really he, good. On he Saturday. was the great hope here. He is the great hope here. Sure. He took comparisons to Palmer and we kind of sort of forgot about him a little bit because of what Radish has gone through means getting socked around down in Norfolk over the weekend. Right. I mean, they've had these flashes of other People, I mean, Bradish kind of, I don't say came from nowhere, but certainly was not expected to be the Cy Young contender and the perennial horse and the guy who's going to get the $200 million sort of arm. That's Grayson Rodriguez and exclamation point, right? I mean, hey, you, I'm not your opening day starter. Okay, okay, here we go. Like, you know, and honestly, see, hearing McDonald in the booth and especially with Palmer, and let me just... Let me exhale for a minute because I'm going to say something relatively profound to start this whole thing because I have been in touch with David Rubenstein's people on the inside. I'm not going to say anything more than that other than I've met with them and they they know who I am and they know what I represent and they know who you are and we'll see. So I'll, I'll begin with that. But there are two shows going on here, right? There's the show on the field. And there's a show off the field, right? Like with the new ownership, everything, you know, I see Rob Long and Melanie Newman in the pregame show. I see Palmer and McDonald together, which never happens because it's opening day weekend. And that was just like awesome. You know, like Palmer and McDonald together. Awesome. Um, Apart. Awesome. Fine. Good. You know, I mean, I'm a, I, 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 you know, I lived through the Angelos era. I'm, that's the first time I said that. I'm going to say that a lot. I lived through the Angelos era. And there was a lot of awful and a lot of everything, but I'd like the broadcast to be open. I'd like when Jorge Mateo jakes it on a triple that they get a little antsy about that. I want to see a real, I want to know what a real thing looks like. And I don't know if it'll ever come back. I watch what's going on. I passed Michelle Andres in the halls at the Ritz Carlton last week. And, you know, I see the show they're putting on out there, 365, which is fake reality. It's the real housewives of the Potomac. You know, it's fake reality TV from the Ravens perspective, but from the Orioles perspective, empty seats over the weekend teams, really good tickets are really cheap. I look tickets are nine bucks and I don't have that sort of like, I'm not going to give them 20 bucks. I mean, I paid to go opening day. You, you know, I paid full price. I walked around. Um, I drank a beer cause somebody gave me one, but like I'm trying to wash away and I'll keep using this a lot of terrorism and a lot of trauma um, in regard to, some of the people, I, I mean, Lucasaurus is still running around. TJ Brightman's still running around, like all of that. But the team on the field and the broadcast, and this is where I wanted to start with Palmer and McDonald. and Like, it, it's a pleasure to sit at home and watch it on television when it's good, when the team's good, when they're losing by a couple of runs, when the pitcher's getting his head beaten in the first inning and the second inning, and you have real baseball strategy, and we're going to go to the bullpen, and the Royals are coming in, and who's pitching tomorrow, and who's up, and who's down. Like, I love baseball, and I like the heartbeat of it now a lot more than I liked it two weeks ago with you, where Angelos owns the team, and I'm rolling around Sarasota, and the games don't mean anything. And Like, this means a lot now. Like, now they're up for a second division ownership change, everything about it, I'm watching, I'm finding in the first five days more than I than I have in a long time. I'm real interested. I'm real interested in how this could resurrect the city. I saw what it did to the city on Thursday. I was in the middle of it, driving Pika home in the traffic past where I used to live for 20 years. So I'm emotional about it. And I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the pregame show and I want it to be good. I'm I'm rooting for these people. I'm rooting for all of it in a big, big, big way. I've waited my whole life uh, for this. I've waited a long, long, I'm looking at the pictures from what I looked like back in the 90s when Angelos took over the team and was lying to me over at the barn. Like, they've got a real chance here. And every empty seat angers me now. Every Every empty seat's an opportunity. And I hope they feel that way because... The team's really good. And I was a little disheartened that there weren't more people there on Easter Sunday. And, you know, my wife said, it's Easter. Luke's not even there. Relax. Relax. It's cool. And I'm like, 
all right, I want to see some gusto. Yeah. I want to see some momentum because, dude, you and I are going to get together five days a week and they're going to win baseball games, right? I mean, you, you don't think there's any way they that they're not going to be really good based on the first two starts we saw. <laughs> I mean, their pitching's well, better I'm, than we think, I, I bet. Well, they won 101 games last year. I mean, let's not act like, and it's not that terribly different of a team. I mean, you, you, okay, you subtract Kyle Gibson. We'll see about Kyle Bradish, obviously. Uh, and John Means, you know, was not a good opening rehab start at Norfolk. It's one start. You know, we'll, we'll see. Let's see at least a couple more of those before we uh, press the panic button. But, you know, by and large, it's really the same team i mean it really is i mean aaron hicks was running around for the angels uh striking out three times against grayson rodriguez on saturday night but it's mostly the same team so yeah i have every expectation they're going to be really good does that mean they're going to win 101 again does that mean they're going to win 104 it's baseball you know and this was a team that won a ton of one run games last year that's why i've expressed as much concern as i have about the bullpen and let's face it the bullpen really didn't come into play a whole lot over the course of the weekend. It's just, it's what happens when you have two blowout victories. And then uh, in the finale, you're behind four, one, and you never bullpen kept it close at, at the very least gave them a chance in the, in the late innings, but we haven't really seen what that looks like. But beyond that. And when I say I'm concerned about the bullpen, it doesn't mean I think it's the worst in baseball. It just means you're replacing Felix Batista. You did it for a month last year and it was admirable to the degree that they were able to step up. But that's different than doing it for 162 games. And that's that's where my, I don't know if I'd say trepidation as much as I, I'm taking some pause about this team. And, and they're also playing in the American League East. Yankees look really good down in uh, in Houston, disposing of the Astros over uh, a four-game set. Really impressive. Yeah, we uh, haven't talked part. at all about the Yankees or the Blue Jays. Or the, we, we don't talk about anything here but us, 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 me, 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 we, we, we. Like, you and I don't ever talk about who's coming to get the Orioles, right? <laughs> yeah. including the well, Rangers who came and got him last year. I mean, it's a little bit of we'll worry about that in October. Let's just let's well, just beat the team in front of us. Let's worry about the Royals and the Pirates right now, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And some of it is just you have to let the season breathe a while. You know, I mean, at this point, there's I, I've seen it, and we'll talk about this at least in passing uh, about the Kansas City Royals coming to town. You know, I, I saw some offseason predictions of them being better you know I, I in fact i even saw one or two of them winning that division which i don't think is about the royals as much as people being bleh about that division although i think the tigers are going to be interesting this year uh with some you know some interesting young players on that team i still think the twins are very much a factor but point is we don't exactly know just yet who's good who's bad who's really good who's really bad uh, and some of that is just you gotta let it play out so uh, in the case of uh, the Orioles, why wouldn't you expect them to be really, really good? They won 101 games last year, and uh, it, that that might mean something like, okay, they don't win as many games as they did last year. And I, I went on record saying uh, I think they're going to win 94 games, and but I also think that's going to be good enough to win the division because I think uh, this division, while it's competitive, while you certainly can't count anyone out, although the Red Sox, I'm pretty close to counting them out. I not a big believer in Boston at this point, but the rest of the division, I think you can make cases for them, uh, any of those other teams to win the division. But I think any of those other teams also have question marks. Even the Yankees who four uh, and and feeling like they're on top of the world right now, top of the division through the first weekend for whatever that's worth, which is nothing, but they have a lot I haven't of looked at their payroll in a while. I need to go do that. Figure out how much money they're really spending there, right? I mean, there's, yeah. But at the same time, look at how much money they're spending on older players who are coming off of down years, injury plagued years. In some cases, like Giancarlo Stanton, for example, multiple years where you're looking at them. Oh, they the have same. their own Chris Davis situation. I mean, they there. have all they have all kinds yeah. of situations where they need guys to bounce back. Now, it helps when you acquire Juan Soto, and we've seen him at his best early on. But, you know, I don't want to belabor the point about the Yankees, but it's a tough division still. So even from the standpoint of the Orioles, you might be a believer in them from a true talent level standpoint of, dare I say, even being a little bit better than where they were last year. That doesn't always equate to more wins, though. Uh, we know how that works with baseball, especially with close games. I mean, this team, go look at what their winning percentage was in one-run games last year. That's generally something where you see regression to the mean. You know, when you're playing close games, over the long haul, 
your record's going to, you know, even the good teams, the record's going to be closer to 500 in one run game. So that's why we go back to the point that I made last year to you about you want to win some blowouts and not have to lean on your bullpen. Uh, and the Orioles were able to do that on opening day. And they were able to do that on Saturday night, although they lost CNL Perez to the, to the IL. So right off the bat, you know, uh, uh, an injury concern there, but you know, by and large, why wouldn't you love this team? And the reality is they have so many reinforcements at triple a Jackson holiday off to a great start at Norfolk. I mean, hits a home run in what uh, in Norfolk's opener off a lefty mind you so uh just kind of he also make an error can i point that out he did he did okay. yeah. yeah well I, that that would be mike elias you know a good cop sure. bad cop like let him let him go feel the ball hey, we're, we're we're both using small sample sizes that's what's fun about opening day right i mean you could talk about a you, know, you you win and you're going 162 and oh you lose and the sky is falling but, but Dude, no, you, I, when I, I know guys are making errors in norfolk you know my radar's up right I mean, if your radar's not up on Jackson Holiday, it's never going to be up on any anyone in the minor leagues. I mean, that's how talented this kid is. That's why so many people were so passionate uh, about their decision, uh, one way or the other. So, uh, but well, I remember where I was when I saw him bat for the first time in Sarasota, out in right field with a beer. You know what I mean? Sure, so, yeah. sure. Just like you probably remember, you know, when Gunnar Henderson took his first major league at bat in Cleveland. Uh, what was it? His first at bat, but. Later in that game, hits the home run, his batting helmet flies off, and he's running around the base. That was there when Kurt Schilling took the ball after the big yeah. trade, but Boddicker, you know? So, yeah, like, yeah, I, I mean, got you. You know, I'm, are, I'm, I am I'm, was there when Tippy Martinez and Rick Dempsey came over in the big trade, you know? Like, I, th- dude, I, I've been here for all of them, uh, except ownership changes, which, I, you know, I'm keeping an eye on. Luke Jones is at Baltimore Luke. He is Luke at WNST.net if you want to find him. Uh, we're at on the socials. Um, this week, Jeff Montgomery's coming on. We're going to talk some Royals baseball. And I'm doing a lot of baseball this week, and I'm going to wind up doing a lot of politics later on in the month because I ran into tons and tons of politicos and obviously with what's going on with the key bridge and what's going on with an election. So a lot of things are happening and tectonic plates are shifting around. There's also a 25th anniversary documentary that I've been working on with Blue Rock Productions uh, this month to um, accurately portray true history. And uh, I'll probably entertain you for about 30 minutes before it's all over with as well. Hopefully we're entertaining you around here, sharing the word that uh, we're on the beat for all things Orioles baseball on a daily basis. Um, One thing I would say, we keep talking about the, CNL Perez and the injuries and the bullpen. I think about that Cano Batista thing that happened last year. And I even think about like the Orioles getting eliminated in 14 by the Royals where they had three of that with Davis and in the, in the bullpen that they Mm -hmm. had in Kansas city where you go seven, eight, nine, it's a six inning game. The Orioles played maybe six weeks of ball at a really um, important time in the history of the franchise in May and June of last year, where they were moving from being a team that was on the come to being a team that here they come. And I don't, I don't know that that's replicable. You know, I remember when Oral Hershiser, nobody could score a run off him for six weeks. Like there had, there have been these pitching well, Maddox had 10 years of it, but uh, Pedro had about four years of it. I mean, there, there are some guys that you can't hit ever, whatever, but bullpens and the ups and downs of how good a guy can be one year and not the next year. And then, you know, giving Kimbrell a billion dollars and having him come in and having to be the guy in those situations, to your point, all of those high leverage situations last year. I mean, every game's a one run game and they got through with two guys they were paying nothing to, one whose arm fell off, the other one is just, a, you know, a guy, like a guy that won the Kentucky Derby once that wasn't that kind of horse, literally, right? And, but we'll see, but I don't expect that, right? And and I think that that's part that I'm into this year with this team and this ownership group and this sea change for whatever their philosophy is going to be. And again, I think they're going to win and I'm going to be bored with them winning. Like literally, it's, I don't mean that to be, I want to watch what they're doing to lift the city. That's, that's what I'm doing. I mean, literally. So when they're asking me, I'm watching what they're doing to get more people down. I was treated well by several Oriole employees on opening day. Dude, help me get my ticket. It was very like, like, I probably should be putting more of that up on social media, but it's just sort of happening to me that I bought a ticket. I walked to the box office. I wanted to get in. I didn't post much, but 
the team's going to be good. And you and I are going to be on the team every day and pitching changes and stuff like that. But I, I expect a completely different narrative because I've been a baseball fan all my life. This is my 53rd, 52nd season of watching baseball all the way through it's my 32nd, 33rd year on the radio. It's my 41st year with a media credential. Um, started in 1984. So I've watched a lot of baseball. This year's different than any other year because of what this thing could, I've seen what baseball is to St. Louis, what it is to Boston, what it used to be here. My last name's Aparicio. Um, you know, watching all of this unfold and watching people come back downtown and all of that, the, the narrative of the team and who you fall in love with and the squirt zone and like all the things that they're doing down there to try to get, get people back. And I still see all these empty seats. And somebody said they should put a tent over the the upper left field, the seats that I love, the free the bird seats, the, the upper right. left field seats that they're always going to be empty. And I know I had Janet Marie on this week talking about all of this, but the, the narrative of the team and who hits what and who pitches what the bullpen to your point and the pitching Every day we're going to be measuring that as baseball people, because dude, they're going to hit the ball. They're like, they're, these guys are going to hit. The, they might not score thirteen runs every night, right. but they're going to, when they get behind four nothing in the second inning. It, it's not turn the game off and bring it back in the fifth inning. It's every at bats a walk and a double and a home run, and it's tight. You know, like, and that's always the kind of fireworks the team will have. And for that, they're going to get my nine innings every night, right? Like they're going to get a full effort from me as a fan because I, I they they can win any game. I mean, they got behind early. They didn't catch up on Sunday. They didn't hit the ball, but they're going to hit the ball. And this is a really, really compelling baseball story for everybody in baseball, not just guys named Aparicio and Jones in Baltimore who do sports media. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'll continue to go back to what I said about last year's team. I mean, they were really good. They won 101 games. They're not coming out of nowhere this year. I mean, and that's where it is different. And you made you made the point uh, as you were talking about Yanir Cano as far as when they kind of had that jumping off moment from, all right, end of 2022. They played well, really well in the second half. And they were in the wild card race until about the last week of September uh, that year. Uh Unexpected. Uh, I mean, wildly unexpected. And it was also Last clear year. when Rutschman came up, the leadership that he brought. Right. Even right. A, a bad team that was coming on. Literally, they right. had a leader. Yeah. And even early in that 2022 season, even when they were losing games, it still looked different. If you were watching it every night, it was much more competitive. It, it, it was not these games where you're just saying these guys aren't major league players or this guy on the mound's not a major league pitcher. It started looking different then. And then when Rutschman arrived, right, they took off, but there was still that sense in April and May of last year of, okay, they're going to be competitive. They're going to be in the playoff race because you have three wild cards now, for example. I mean, you, you know, you go through all the reasons why, but for them to play at the, at the level that they did last year, to win over 100 games for the first time in over 40 years, uh, to be the best team in the American League. That was, you know, you don't do, that's not a fluke, right? You you can fluke your way into maybe winning 87 games uh, if you're fantastic in, in one-run games and you sneak in as the last wild card. You know, we talk about this a lot with the NFL. I mean, look at where the Steelers have been the last couple of years where they've gotten lousy, lousy quarterback play, but the rest of their team's been good enough and they sneak in as the number seven seed in the AFC. You can do that, but you don't sneak your way into 101 wins, right? And and, and that's what this team did last year. So uh, you look at them this year, and by and large, when you say that they're a year older, sometimes that has a negative connotation. Like for the Yankees, for example, right now, despite the fact that they did well in Houston, they're all a year older. And that's that's not a good thing for Stanton. That's not a good thing for Anthony Rizzo. That's not a good thing. Uh, for some of their older players. But when you're a team like the Orioles, where just about everyone other than what, Craig Kimbrell and you know, James McCann, let's say, although you know, it's not like he's 38 years old or anything like that. You know, these guys are a year older. That just means you're a little more experienced. And that's a good thing uh, for just about the entire roster. So uh, I'm with you on that. I mean, it, it's an offense that you know, they didn't lead baseball. Uh, you know, they weren't the best offense in baseball last year, but 
when you have Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutschman, one, two, uh, I mean, you're starting off every game like that. You're starting every time through the order with those two guys. And then you throw in Mount Castle the way that he's swinging right now, knowing that he's streaky, but right now it's a hot streak for Ryan Mountcastle and Santander and Hayes. And, you know, hope, hoping to see more from Westberg this year, you know, throw Colton Kowser into the mix. Uh, Cedric Mullins, you want to see him bounce back from, from the injuries last year. You know, there, there's a lot of depth there. Now you get to the bottom of the lineup and this is where we get into the Jackson holiday watch or Kobe Mayo watch or Heston Kerstad watch, uh, or, you know, throw Kyle Stowers in there, get to the bottom of the order and you have Arias and Mateo. Okay. That's a little bit different, you know, right. I mean, those, those guys don't have as much long-term upside certainly, but it's a lineup that to your point, you're not going to score 24 runs. Uh, every two games like they did in the first two of the season, but which uh, are against bad pitching. Yeah, sure. Sure. And, and by the way, since you mentioned that, how about the fact that the angels had a team meeting after the second game of the season, uh, Ron Washington, God bless, man. I think it's going to be a long year uh, for the Angels, but uh, that's that's not exactly Every a big Every year's show. a long year for the Angels, and they lost their best player, which may have been a blessing for them. By the way, dude, I, I, I can't help but get fascinated because I love Tokyo, and I love Japan, mm-hmm. and I love baseball, and you know, I'm fascinated by this world of gambling and players and how they're going to lie and get up and lie. I, we, we, Dude, you were standing there where Ray Rice looked you in the eye and told you didn't punch his wife, right? Like, so they all lie, and then the receipts come, and who knows who covers up what in investigations? We still have oral reports being given to commissioners of the NFL um, by legitimate people, you know, over all sorts of tawdry allegations that later on would be shoved under the carpet. And I actually had a billionaire run from me on a veranda last year after taking my press credential away. So all things are on, you know, are on board about how the reporting is and who's massaging what, but it's trouble for baseball. You know, I'll just say that start the week. I mean, the angels were here without Otani who I've still never seen play, by the way. Like, so, I mean, I was in Yankee. I was in New York one night. He was pitching. Like I never saw him. And I want to, and I was making a big deal about whenever I did it. Now he's with the Dodgers, and Lord knows he might be behind. He might be in prison before it's all over. You know, like, it's crazy whatever happens here. But then there's nobody in Oakland. What are they doing? Like, I mean, the season begins, and they have scandal in L.A., right? The the, the Angels can't compete now. Oakland's terrible. And we have this great story here of new ownership and like all this awesome stuff that could happen here. Boy, Rob Manfred's office is on fire. And, it, you know, by the way, it's not even April Fool's. That's that's real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's what uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. I, I, I don't know if I subscribe to that, but look, I mean, it's the NFL has I mean. Rashid Rice for the for the, oh my for God. the Chiefs. I mean, I you bring that this. up. Yeah, uh, but I'm just, my. I guess my point is not to deflect. I mean, when you're talking about Shohei Otani and any link to gambling, and when you think about the connotations of that, you know, Pete Rose, go back to the, the Julius Joe Jackson. I mean, there, there's a long history of gambling being what it was in terms of the unspeakable act, and now when it's every other commercial, when you're tuning into the Orioles or a national broadcast on ESPN, where they're, you know, they're they're promoting their own, you know, their own content as it pertains to gambling. Uh, I, I mean, I'm the, not, the I'm Ravens not here. welcome their players onto a couch on a show that is a gambling show before they ever wear a uniform. They're under a gambling shield now. So like, I mean, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those where, where you look at it and look, I'm not going to sit here and say that I expected it to be Shohei Otani or his interpreter or whatever the story is ultimately going to be with that. But I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm surprised to see there be some troubling, concerning link uh, of a player to gambling. I mean, Calvin Ridley was suspended, you know, in the NFL uh, a couple years ago. Uh, you know, a high-profile player who just got big money uh, in Tennessee. So the I, ESPN story over the weekend on Otani's relationship with that guy. Did you read that piece? I did not. I, I saw some bits and pieces of it. Fantastic, but, yeah. fantastic piece. If anybody wants to understand it, I'll probably share it out on my social because I probably should. But it was, um, I mean, this is a 
Five, this is a big, big alarm for baseball. While we have good sure. stuff going on here in new ownership, and I'll be all about paying attention to all this stuff going on here. I mean, that thing in Oakland, the fact that they've effed this up again after two decades ago, they played games in San Juan with what became the Nationals. And, you know, the amazing thing about Rubenstein is if I were really to sit with him like Ryan Ripken did last week and had an exclusive, you know, whatever, it's unbelievable to me that. I wrote the Peter Principles all these years ago and I stopped in 2006 because of the Masson thing. And that was 10 years ago. It was mm-hmm. an eight year fight then. It's been an 18 year fight. The last time they moved the franchise over the television rights, they that's how effed up these people are. They, they never got that right with Peter. They never got it right for DC. DC won a, 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 had a had a title has been blown up and they still never got their television money right. They've been two franchises that have been a mess from the very beginning for two decades, despite pumping out money and good teams and Buck Showalter and all that. This Oakland thing's been a steamer since Charlie Finley. Like literally it's been a, st- and they can't fix it. And they couldn't fix Peter. They, I mean, they let this thing sit here and rot for two decades before they would do anything as an entity to clean it up because they can't take out their laundry in Tampa and in Oakland. And it, I mean, and the season begins and they got these games. I mean, like the overall issues for baseball, I, I mean, they, they need better leadership, dude. That's all. That's all I'm going to say. They need they need to do this better. Yeah, I mean. We, we say that in every sport, though. I mean, there's there's good stuff and there's stuff where you say, wow, how is I mean, you mentioned Oakland. I mean, the Raiders played in Oakland in a lame duck fashion for, uh, what, two or three seasons. I mean, it, it you know, they announced they were going to Vegas and that didn't happen over. I mean, it's just that that whole dynamic is just it's sad in, for the fan base. You know, I what on opening night, uh, the, the A's had more people out in the parking lots tailgating. Uh, as a protest event than people that it's were in clear the they had I no mean, plan it's... you know what i mean like in november nobody yeah, knew where I mean... they were going to play i had maury brown and, right. and eric on back in january when the word leaked about rubenstein and i'm like where are they going to play like there's a million baseball fields in this country, right? Like there's places they could go and play right. and maybe somebody would show up and there wouldn't be rats running around. I've been in that building, dude, it should be condemned. Like, it, it, it's disgraceful that they're they're putting the major league baseball sh- it it defaces their shield it really does it does well just the fact that they're still playing there but then even from the standpoint of you have made it clear you are leaving that 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 is you're you've said it's no longer tenable but then you're going to continue playing there for i don't want to say an indefinite period of time but some you know there's some uncertainty it's not fair to the players man you know Oh, and I guess, I guess the mindset and, and, you know, since I brought it up, I mean, you look at the NFL with what they did with the Raiders. I mean, and we've talked about this. I've I've always found the Raiders to be a really unique uh, fan base beyond the black hole dressing up like Darth Vader and looking like it's Halloween. But just the standpoint of people still supported the team knowing they were leaving and, you know, we've talked about that in ter- for decades now in terms of how the Colts are perceived, still perceived to this day. I mean, uh, you know, we've even had conversations recently about, you know, what Indianapolis is, what that franchise is, what it means to Baltimore now, all of those different things. But just that dynamic that, you know, the Raiders played there and they still ended up drawing pretty well those couple of years. Now, that's not happening with the A's and part of it's the A's stink, too, uh, at this point in time. And everything about it is bottom of the barrel right i mean payroll all everything you know that, how that could they not to. stink that was my point i mean but i guess but i guess it's, there's it's made major league baseball uncompetitive in that way because they're like a minor league team literally yeah i mean it's just uh, you know i mean there have been te- there are teams I and mean, the orioles are a good example of this <laughs> recently where you, you know you can be bottom of the pay bottom of the barrel in terms of payroll and still have good players uh but i just think it's a weird dynamic when you say you're going to move yet you hang around then for an indefinite period of time. It It's very much like a, a couple that separates and say, okay, we're done. You know, we're getting a divorce, yet they're going to live together for another year or two. Like, I mean, that's kind of sort of what it is. You know, it's kind of a lame analogy, but that's the best I can think of uh, in terms of just how odd that is. And I guess 
from an ownership standpoint, from a Major League Baseball standpoint, and maybe not Oakland because they haven't drawn – I mean, no one's gone to the Coliseum for years. It's part of the reason – you know, at least one of many reasons why it's no longer going to be there. Uh, but, you know, there, there's probably a sense of, well, we have a, a fan base that has a history with us. We know we're not going to sell out the place, but there might be a, a large enough percentage of fans that will still come to games compared to just arbitrarily placing the team in, I don't know, Sacramento, you know, name your city where, you know, Nashville, you know, uh, where, where people know if they're not going to be there long term, that they're not going to come watch them. Uh, so, well, they also know, unfairly just... compete with the Albuquerque Weird. Dukes or wherever they go. Right. So right, they can't right. just plop down into round rock and play. Um, I, I, so, I, so that's yeah, the, right. I mean, you're, exactly. So that's part of the challenge here. But yeah, in the meantime, that you're going to continue to play there in that kind of a broken down facility. Uh, in that kind of an environment, I mean, think about these guys. It's opening day and there was no one there. I mean, I'm not talking about recent opening days in Baltimore where I get it. The Orioles, 110 losses. It's not as though there were only 10,000 people in the ballpark on opening day. It was still mostly filled, right? Uh, I mean, even even at the leanest, not talking about the, the COVID year. Uh, but, I, I mean, that's a case where people are actively staying away. There are people making a concerted effort to show up and be in the parking lot and party as Oakland fans, but saying to the franchise, forget you guys. I am not going into the ballpark. I'm not even going to go into the ballpark to use the, the leaky pipe bathrooms. So, I mean, it just, it's just, it's uncomfortable from that standpoint. I mean, I admire the fans who are trying to express and make their voices heard. I mean, we yeah, saw I'm that I'm one last of those year. guys. By the way, yeah, I ran into yeah. a dude on the club level who was wearing a Free the Bird shirt on opening day. It there brought a tear to my eye. So I had to share that picture. But uh, so I'm appreciative. So, so yeah. So, so uh, I mean, look, and to bring it back to the Orioles, because, you know, uh, you know that, that's there's a lot that new ownership has to tackle here. As I said to you, as we were recapping opening day, and since you brought up Masson, I mean, one of my – very first questions, if I had a chance to sit down with David Rubenstein for a few minutes, would be, you know, what's your outlook for Masson? You know, how do you see Masson working uh, for, you know, as, in terms of for the Orioles, in terms of disagreement in place with, you know, with the Orioles and the Nationals and, and ownership of the team and percentage of that? In but, terms of you have a television that, station that could have my show on at lunchtime and Ryan Ripkin's on for breakfast and you can, you know what I mean? Like, it's a television network. You could do something with it if you chose to. You can. <laughs> you can, but you also need to figure out what that looks like because, believe me, there are plenty of regional sports networks in Major League Baseball. I think Kevin figured it out. It's There's that, not a model because there's 10,000 channels and I'm getting people onto my channel without having to pay cable television. Right, sure. But, but the point, and my but the show's point is, free. Yeah. But, I, yeah. but I've seen some of those regional sports networks that had lots of a really compelling original programming. I, I saw it. I, I've used Pittsburgh as an example where I live. I get uh, Pittsburgh. I can't even remember what it's called because it's had so many name changes and ownership Root. changes and all that Root. in terms. I, I don't think it's rude anymore, Yeah, I know, uh, but, but whatever it, it is. The, the, right. But the point is lots of really good original programming. Like you just suggested, it didn't work. You know, it didn't work for what. So my very first question for, for Ruben or one of the first questions would be, you know, what what is your outlook for Masson and what's your level of urgency and how do you plan to offer direct to consumer viewing options in this market? Not talking about MLB TV, where if someone is living out in San Francisco, they can watch the Orioles every single night other than when they're playing the San Francisco Giants because you don't have blackout you know, rules uh, apply. But how are you doing that? What are you doing in terms of offering streaming options, whether that's being on YouTube TV, whether that's being on Hulu, whether that's being on whatever it might be, or, and I think this is still where big picture, where things are going to need to head for not just the Orioles, but all of major league baseball. How are you going to package direct to consumer options where I can say, I'm going to pay $200 a year to have access to watch the Orioles on my TV with my fire stick or Roku where I can stream it. Whether I whether I can stream it on my phone, my tablet, and I get I a free bleacher seat for you know one game this year, sure, sure, and what free I, parking it to get me down to the ballpark for free as part of being a subscriber, you know, yeah, like. But however you want to package that, because we know that subscribing to Directv or Xfinity or whatever it might be, that model as it has existed for the last few decades is, is going away. It's going away. It's not dead yet. 
but it's going away. It is in rapid decline. So I'm not saying you kill that today, but boy, you better be thinking about the future. You better be thinking about how that's going to look because I'm 40 years old, everyone younger than me, other than your most hardcore of baseball fans. And by the way, there are plenty of hardcore Orioles fans who can't afford satellite to the price that they're paying or the the premier package that you have to pay th- that Masson's on uh, for, for your cable subscribers. So they're listening to the games on the radio and they're watching game, stray games when they can. But, you know, that's a problem. That's a long term problem. And that's not you got to bring the, the game Orioles. to people to your point. That's you got to bring the game to people. It's everyone that that's all 30 teams are dealing with that right now. And I don't think it's as simple as just, well, we're going to. Yeah, we're going to broker it all out to, okay, you'll, you'll get an Apple TV game at every three weeks. You're going to get a game on Peacock every other. Yeah, you can have some of that, fine. You know, we're, we're seeing the NFL do that now with playoff games even. But, boy, you better have some direct-to-consumer options and good ones. And, and again, you want younger people especially to engage. I've even seen some recent statistics, Nestor. Youth baseball, I, I've seen some – encouraging signs that it's actually participation's actually trending up after being way down for a long time. But that doesn't mean that you're going to automatically get them to sit there and watch 50 Orioles games a year or however many games they watch when, when they're home or, or in the evening for younger people. And, and we've talked about it. Dude, if David Rubenstein a- paid somebody a half a million dollars to sit in the, in the ballpark, paid some, I don't, I don't, I don't even know who it would be. You know, I think it's somebody like George Henderson. We just lost recently. So I want to give him a shout out because uh, he loved me and loved my show. He was a baseball man. Um, but that kind of person to Bill Steck, go out in the community and do nothing but encourage people to play little league baseball instead of lacrosse, encouraging parents. Like that would be a really difficult position. Just if, if you were the czar of getting kids to play baseball in Baltimore, under the sure. umbrella of a Cal Ripken league and a – there's an interesting guy. How about make Cal Ripken that guy? It's pretty – I think he already is that guy. Um, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, I think he is that guy. Um, so Cal Ripken, fine. Okay. I mean, all these encouraging statistics. I call Kaka on that, ah, uh, you know, because I, I do that on most statistics, which pisses off people, but um, because I think they're fabricated by people who want to make them smell good, I still pass lacrosse – feels everywhere I, you know, living in Baltimore County, everywhere I go. And, and, and that's really anecdotal. A, I mean, but it's one or the other, it, you know what I mean? Sure. It, it really is a one or the other. So everyone I see there, I know that's not a baseball opportunity anymore. And I think that would be an interesting thing to put in front of Rubenstein from a, um, you know, something interesting that, that they would be doing here that maybe they don't do everywhere else is like trying to get kids to play baseball. Tom Lavero came on last week to talk about, um, and we'll break because you and I got to like talk about what's going on in the field right, and, as well. And, and let me just yeah, good, sure. I mean, it really comes down to this. Look, there's not one initiative. It's casting as wide a net as you can. Uh, I mean, it really, truly is. Uh, I've focused a lot on the TV side of that from the standpoint of because I know, I know what my direct TV bill is every month. And honestly, I probably wouldn't have it if it wasn't for the fact that that's the easiest, most practical way for me to legally have mass in. Uh, could I could I go the MLB TV route and get a VPN and to change my IP address and make it look like I'm in Colorado and get the Orioles games? Yeah, and I believe me, I know people who do that. I know a lot of people who do that, quite frankly. But the idea of cast a wide enough net, create enough interest, and look, I am not expecting it to go back to 1989 where half the Orioles games are on broadcast TV. That ship has long since sailed. I am perfectly willing and happy to pay a fair price to have Masson. But when it's lumped in with having to pay, you know, and I'm just throwing out a number. It's not quite this high, but $200 a month for an overall satellite or cable package that I'm not watching enough to justify that. I'd much rather pay, I don't know, would I pay $200 just in isolation that I would have access to watch every game that's on Masson? Just that, but have no – have the commitment to have to pay for cable or, or satellite? I'd probably do that. In fact, I'd probably do that and wouldn't even think that much about it. I mean, I, it would have that kind of value to me, but that option's not even I there wonder how many people would have living. that value too. And that's and what look, scares and, the living bejesus sure, out of them. Sure, I, I mean, of course, but but that's where we're heading. And, and look, that, the NBA is thinking about that oh, in the same every, way. Oh, it's, the NHL. Yeah, yeah. The only one who's not is the NFL because the NFL is its own 
I, I mean, there's pro sports in, in America, and there's the NFL. Uh, well, Vince McMahon still... had to think this through 10 years ago, right? I mean, you're a wrestling fan. It's wrestling week. Like, how do I serve wrestling fans, right? Literally. Yeah, right? I mean, they, they've already gone from having their own streaming network to now it's it's been hosted by Peacock over the last few years. And now starting next fall, or I, I, I might be starting, I think it may be a starting beginning of 2025, Monday Night Raw, which has been on either USA or I'm trying to think what it was even called back then, TNN, whatever it was, that it's been on traditional cable TV, it's going to Netflix. And I mean, they're getting billions of dollars to, to put their flagship, what are their two flagship shows on Netflix? It's going to be fascinating to see what that, you know, how profitable that is. I mean, they're going to get their money. It's going to be fascinating to see how profitable that is for net, Netflix in terms of do they get a spike subscription or does that end up being something that maybe isn't, you know, uh, they're all figuring it out because it's changing. It's changing. And I think especially for older traditional billionaire baseball owners or any of these sports owners, thinking about how people have consumed games on cable TV, satellite TV for the longest time. And to think that that's in rapid decline and to think that not just 20 somethings, but 30 somethings and 40 somethings and, and even go on, go on up more and more people are streaming and consuming their TV way differently. So you got to figure out what the sweet spot is and yeah, you'll probably take a, you know, you're going to take a hit at least from a short-term standpoint in terms of revenue. But if you want to maximize your long-term potential in terms of not just revenue, but growth and to your point, getting more and more people interested in baseball, boy, you, you better be creative and you better be thinking as many different ways that you can cast a net to, to attract fans. And it's not going to be a one size fits all easy fix. Uh, but I think if you're, if, if you've got uh, enough of, gr of a grind and hustle to do it and, and to come up with enough ways. Yeah. I, I think you can absolutely spark a lot of interest. And by the way, it's really going to help from the standpoint of locally, you have this team that is coming off of 101 wins and should be really, really good again and should be for the foreseeable future. So they've got that going for them, but they, they do have a lot of work to do. And like I said, these are not just Orioles exclusive problems. These are major league baseball uh, issues to tackle and to reimagine as we get deeper and deeper into the 21st century. I mentioned Tom Lavero's piece, uh, just talking to Angelos and the history and all that, but he does a thing with kids for cigars and curveballs about getting city kids to play baseball. And that's the RBI program, as is known here. So I wanted to throw that in because that was where I was headed with that. You can find that and everything else at Baltimore Positive. You can find Luke and on social media at Baltimore Luke. You can find me, us, we, at Costas next Tuesday in the morning for the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery, as well as next Friday at Fadley's the 12th, as well as the 26th. We'll be at Fadley's live from 2 until 5. Talking baseball and other things, political season. Uh, got some concerts coming up, some musicians coming on. On. Um, I'm Nestor. We're WNST AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking Baltimore positive.